So today I just want to explain some of the intuition behind the Kalman filter algorithms. Now if you haven't learned about Kalman filters to begin with, I recommend you to at least see the basic equations to implement the Kalman filter algorithm before watching this video. I just wanted to clear up why the equations are the way they are, why we're we using these variables and, and where they come from and why it's such a powerful algorithm. So if you haven't yet seen, like I said, the actual equations, I recommend you do before continuing, but this is just going to explain the intuition behind the actual common filter. So before I begin, I just want to recap the two basic ideas of the common filter. So we know that the first main thing with the common filter is we want to predict where we are, right? We want to predict a model of our world, whatever it may be. The classic example is to uh, monitor the position of a certain object. So we usually model in our state, position, and velocity. And then we also have the additional term for acceleration to actually model additional acceleration, but we'll see why this is not always such a good idea with the Kalman filter. Um, but again, we wanna predict where we are. And then the second step is to update, right? So we take sensor measurements or whatever type of additional information we can actually find and use it and incorporate that into our prediction to make better predictions in the future and to update our belief about the current state and how well we can produce accurate results. So again, those are the two main components of the common filter, the two basic steps. And I just want to go over some terminology before going any further because there's tons of variable names and I understand it can get confusing very quickly. So I just wanna go over some convention that I'm going to use for this video. Basically, if I have a variable V, right, any variable V, and I put a little bar over it. This is denoted as V bar. What this means, this is a variable that I created during the prediction step. So this is basically a predicted variable. And I don't know why that letter D came out much larger than expected, but um, basically V bar again is just the, a predicted variable. So this comes from the predict step. V hat, which looks like a little carrot, right? It looks like if I were to close this, it'd make a diamond. So I guess choosing the letter V wasn't the best choice, but basically V hat, is going to be a variable that comes from the update step. So after I take into consideration the sensor measurements, this is my new updated variable V. And if I just have a variable V that has no modifier at the top, no bar, no hat or nothing, this means the actual value, right? Actual value. Now what I mean by actual value? Well, in this case, if you've already seen the Cohen filter equations, X would be the actual state. Right? We don't know the actual state. That's why we're doing the common filter to begin with. So X would be the actual state. Z would be our actual uh, measurement, what we're actually recording. So these are the actual things. And we actually get some of these from the sensors. But this is why we're using a, a filter to begin with. It's because we don't know these values. But if I just do a variable V without any sort of modifier on the top, I'm referring to the actual value. Okay, so this is just convention before we go on. So I just want to um, elaborate on the prediction step. So here we go. I'll say that the prediction step is right here. Going back to the classical example of position tracking, we want to mo model our state, I'll say X, right? X is just gonna be our state model, how we're going to describe the state. And in most of the common filter videos, basically it's described as position and velocity, like this, right? This is our state, we're modeling it as position and velocity. And what we're trying to estimate, what we're trying to find out is denoted by the variable Z, which in our case is just a scalar value for a position, right? It's just a matrix of one value. You could even think of it as a, as a real number. It's just a scalar, but we're putting it in, in matrix notation. Now, if we're referring to the act to the to object tracking, we have a set of uh, physics, physics equations that are going to help us denote how to actually track this variable X. So going back to uh, basic physics, you know, elementary physics, now, I don't want to go too deep into actual physics because this is not a lecture on physics. It's on common filters. But if I want to estimate, right, if I want to estimate my current state, x bar of t, and x bar of t, again, is going to contain position and velocity. Basically, I want to use my old position. Now, before, before I go on to this, let, let's actually just talk about position for, for a while. To estimate the position at time t, this is going to require knowing my position at the previous time step. So times at times T minus one. And then to this, I have to add my velocity at this time step T minus one times the elapsed time delta T, right? I'm, I'm denoting it by time T and T minus one, but there could be 10 seconds in between. There could be one second in between. So I'll just denote this as delta T. 
And then we also add the acceleration, which I'll just denote by letter A, at times t minus 1 times delta t squared over 2. Now, don't get worried if you don't understand this. This is just standard physics equations. And if you actually do the calculus, you'll realize this is, this is actually how it all plays out. Now, on most of the common filter videos, you'll probably realize that, that the acceleration is zero. So this term doesn't even matter. But if you actually get a constant value for acceleration, if you actually have a, a real value that's not zero, this is the general form of the equation that you use for position, right? So if we know all these three things, we can get our position at time t. Similarly, for velocity at time t, this will just be our previous velocity at times t minus one plus our acceleration at time t minus one times the elapsed time. And this just all goes back to basic derivatives and, and calculus and, and things like this. So these are the equations that we're working with for position tracking. So how does this blend into the actual common filter? Well, the common filter for predicting a state x, right, x bar of t, our prediction step, before taking other sensor measurements, it's essentially going to say, well, this has to be some value a, and a, a is a matrix that we'll talk about in a second, times our best known state, our best, our talk, to the point of view right now, the, the most accurate version of where we are, right? So we know that at time t, we would have had to process t minus one. An x hat, remember what I said about things that have a hat? These are the updated variables. So these are variables that we've already fixed and already done all sorts of processing to them to be able to fit well to the sensor measurements. So we know x of t minus one, right? We know time t, time, the time step t minus one pretty well because we've already looked at the sensor measurements and we've already done all this update step. So we're going to base our current estimate on our best estimate from the previous, which happens to be t minus one times this little uh, x, x hat of t minus one. And it's multiplied by a matrix A, and we'll see what this matrix A is in a second. And then we're going to add matrix B times another value called mu. It looks like a U or you know whatever that looks like, but it's supposed to be the Greek letter mu, which kind of looks like a U. But anyways, if, if we're actually tracking position, right? If we're doing this position tracking example, here we go. This is, this is what we're all referring to in the end. You'll realize that to get from this state, right, position and velocity. So here I'm trying to estimate my position and my velocity, right? And I'm saying that this is going to be some matrix A, which I'll leave empty for now. We'll fill this in in a second. And I'm given my position at time t minus one and my velocity at times t minus one. Right, then I'm going to add some value b, which I'll leave empty, times, in this case, a scalar u for acceleration. How am I going to put this together to fit this physics model? Well, we know that position at times t, here's the equation, right? So if we're doing uh, matrix multiplication, you realize we can put a 1 here and a delta t right here. And this will get us position. Because when we, when we do this multiplication, it'll say that the position at times t, right, I'll put t, is equal to one times the previous position plus delta t times the previous velocity and then plus delta t squared over two times acceleration right because this vector addition this matrix addition all the top values right once this multiplication is done we'll get another column vector which is going to look exactly like this except updated for time t then we're going to add right it's a vector addition so we just add each you know each row respectively so it's going to add delta t squared over 2, this value multiplied by the acceleration, which is exactly our physics model right over here. So that's the position. Now we go on to the velocity. The velocity depends nothing on the position. So we can put a 0 here and a 1 for the previous velocity. And then we're going to add delta t times the acceleration. So if you actually go through this matrix multiplication, you'll get that this is going to be the position at t minus 1 plus delta t velocity t minus one on the top before adding this and then on the bottom we'll get zero times position t minus one so i won't even add that I'll, I'll just leave it as a zero plus the previous velocity t minus one so we get this vector and now we have to add it to this vector delta t squared over two delta t this is times mu and times mu so if you get this addition you'll get exactly our physics equation so in the next video we'll go deeper into the common filter and start explaining the intuition behind the equations